Good evening. Good evening, everyone. This is Josh Valentine, communication, uh, digital communications director for Colorado Renewable Energy Society. Um, I'm happy to have everyone here. I hope everyone is doing well. Thanks for joining our next webinar in an ongoing series. It looks like for an indefinite amount of time. So uh, tonight we have Carl Rabago presenting on planning that works using modern planning tools and techniques to achieve 100% carbon free electricity. Carl operates an energy consultancy, Rabago Energy LLC based in Denver. Carl recently led the Pace Energy and Climate Center at the Pace University Elizabeth Howe School of Law in White Plains, New York, where he also taught energy law. Carl has 30 years of experience in energy and climate policy and markets and is recognized as an innovator in utility regulatory issues relating to clean and distributed energy services and technologies. Uh, before we begin with Carl, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, Crest has a brand new website and we're updating all of our, uh, our membership details and data on the back end. So you will have to resubmit um, and renew with us. So if you go on our website, crest-energy.org, uh, please follow the instructions on there. Um, we will be having a Q&A session at the end of this webinar um, where you will be allowed to enter in questions into the GoToWebinar control panel. If you look at that control panel on your screen, there's a questions box submit a question and we'll try to get to it at the end of this webinar. We've blocked out a good amount of time, so I'm pretty sure we're gonna to get to a good number of them. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it along to Carl for his presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks to Chris, thanks to um, the folks at Northern Colorado Partners for Clean Energy and Partners in Climate Action for giving me a chance to talk with you tonight. Um, I find this issue, this topic, of planning, especially utility planning, fascinating. And I, um, ex I'll explain a little bit more why in a minute, but uh, I've got to start with telling you why you've got a picture of my two grandsons on the very first slide first. It's a tradition of mine to put grandchildren on my in my slide presentations. And second, uh, this was a case of planning that worked. Uh, when we were in New York for about a year, my daughter had our first grandson, Jan Jonathan, and we told ourselves that we would get back to Colorado in time to see the second one and to spoil him just as much as we had spoiled Jonathan. Um, so little Judah was born just about oh, three weeks ago now, uh, and we moved back in August. And so with a little bit of foresight, and a little bit of budgeting, and a little bit of a careful consideration of the options, a good plan can yield great results. And this one is working for us, so I hope what I hope to talk about is how a good plan can work for Platte River Power Authority and the member communities in seeking to move towards 100% carbon-free energy. So let's get started without further ado. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about me. This gray hair was earned through 30 years of utility regulation and market work. Um, I've been a developer, a regulator. I've been a, um, a, a public utility commissioner in the state of Texas. I had an opportunity to lead the nation's research and development programs for renewable energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. I've been a utility executive. Um, I've had a chance to do a whole lot of different things. And my wife will tell you that um, that is because I am easily bored. Uh, maybe, but I'm also constantly fascinated. So it's a uh, this is a, a great area to be working in. And I've really enjoyed three decades of work in the electric utility space. Uh, and a little bit in the gas space and some other related energy and, and uh, utility industries. Um, there's a bullet on this slide that, that is a, has got some jargon in it, and I'm going to try to make sure that I clarify any jargon. The third bullet has some, some acronyms, and, and I'm afraid we're prone to a lot of acronyms in this business. Um, please Take advantage of the question box. If you hear me using an acronym and not explaining it, uh, we can keep my uh, our eyes open and the moderators, organizers will help us answer some of those that can be answered immediately. So you don't have to sit there and stew on what the heck did that mean? Um, so the third bullet is an example of some that um, 
that are kind of important in the business we're in these days. New York for the past six years has been doing a reforming the energy vision process, uh, an effort to transform the electric utility industry to take advantage of an exciting and growing array of distributed energy technologies that have lower cost and better service. Maryland uh, has for three years now, been running four years now, been running a utility of the future effort. Rhode Island has been doing power sector transformation. In fact, dozens of states, including our state of Colorado, have been embarked on trying to figure out how to transform the utility industry from the old central station, um, highly polluting, um, sometimes rather brittle model to something that's closer to home, something we're all getting experience with in the face of this COVID virus. Um, and the upshot from that, and the reason I'm spending time on this is to remind you that you're not alone. You're, the inclinations of the communities that are part of Platte River Power Authority to figure out how to get the carbon out of your electricity service and to maintain reliability and, and financial sustainability, I would argue sustainability for people, for the businesses, and, and of course, for all the environmental systems in which we live. Um, those objectives are common and increasingly common. Uh, you'll have great resources to call upon as you move into the details of this, and you will certainly not be planning in isolation. The, the resource um, diversity, policy of the of the Platte River Board, or diversification policy of the Platte River Board anticipates a much more strongly integrated and interconnected Platte River and its member communities. And that is, um, that's the reality everybody is living with. All right, so let's go to the next slide here. And um, just a little bit of why should you bother listening to me? I've already spoken to some of this, but I do want to highlight a couple of things, um, if you will, to sort of tell you my show you my chops here. So the first and most relevant is that I know public power. I've I actually, when I was a public utility commissioner, we regulated all our public power utilities. Um, Years later, relatively recently in 2008, I actually got to go be a vice president at Austin Energy, one of the largest and most progressive uh, municipal electric utilities in the country. I was proud to be the vice president of distributed energy services. I was responsible for solar programs. Uh, our goal was to make more solar happen uh, for energy efficiency, for low income programs. I even had the large industrial clients as part of my my portfolio, I was the citywide climate action plan manager, um, and of course, the, the Austin Energy was the energy manager for the entire city of Austin, which now has about a million people in it, or maybe even more. Um, so I know public power. I've regulated public power. I've been a public power, a co-op member, several times in my in my life, in in the times I've moved around. Um, and so um, I think that helps me understand a little bit. I was actually really good friends with, a, um, with another vice president at Austin Energy who was running our generation business um, until we lost her when she got recruited to Platte River Power. Jackie Sargent, who's back now leading Austin Energy, um, uh, did, did, the, did the, the rotation uh, more formally than I did through positions. And we actually uh, kept in touch and. Um, I learned a lot about Platte River from her as well. I mentioned that I was uh, at the Department of Energy and um, this thing that Platte River is going through called an Integrated Resource Plan or IRP uh, is uh, something that we actually worked to get into an act of Congress in 1992. And then when I was a, a Deputy Assistant Secretary, I spent uh, hard earned taxpayer money to try to advance integrated resource planning throughout the electric utility industry in the United States. And I think uh, with some success. I've also recently been done a lot of work as an expert witness in a lot of uh, utility modernization, grid transformation, um, and uh, grid utility of the future and smart grid cases, as well as a wide range of electric utility rate cases, 
and planning proceedings, IRPs in a number of different states. I've been a developer uh, working with others, uh, of course, as part of a team on wind and solar development. And more recently, and I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail later, um, have had an opportunity to work with the Coalition for Community Solar Access, 60 businesses across the country that are trying to make community solar uh, more available in more places for customers, especially those customers who can't put solar on their roof, either because the roof doesn't work or they're, they're in a rental property or they simply choose not to. Uh, there's this fascinating opportunity of community solar projects. We've been doing a project in which we're uh, developing and applying new modeling techniques to take advantage of distributed energy resources in a way that traditional utility models, uh, such as those typically relied upon by utilities, uh, can't do. And I'm going to show you some of the numbers we've been getting off of that. All right, so that's a little bit about me and why I think you should listen to me. Um, here's the sort of theme message for this talk. Um, We've been running this electric utility industry in this country in pretty much the same model for about 120 years, ever since a guy named Samuel Insull, who uh, founded the first Consolidated Edison in Chicago that led to Consolidated Edison companies all around the country. We've been doing pretty much the same thing. And as technology and economy and customer preferences and all sorts of other things have happened, We've bumped along the road um, and thinking pretty often and pretty periodically that there might be something different we could do. Never has that feeling been stronger than now as things like um, electric vehicles take off, as rooftop solar seems to appear everywhere, as our homes and businesses get more energy efficient, as we've just kind of quietly adopted a revolution of a 95% reduction in energy use through LED light bulbs, um, long lasting, less expensive, more durable devices for making, for using energy and for making energy uh, that we use in our households. As I'm gonna mention later on, we're actually beginning to talk about a world in which we can electrify everything with clean, renewable energy and maintain that reliability and economic security that we value. I, I will also tell you that this particular quote from Winnie the Pooh is one of my favorites. Um, as far as I know, I think I'm the only commissioner who ever cited this in a decision um, about introducing more competition into the telecommunications business in Texas. And I'm, I'm proud to say that when I left the PUC in Texas, the staff gave me a little uh, Winnie the Pooh toy uh, with a, a photocopy of the page from the transcript in which I got to read from Winnie the Pooh, because if you can't have fun, why do it, right? So let's do an overview of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about utility system planning. We're going to talk about how it's evolving, as I've already hinted to you. Um, we're going to uh, we're, we're going to talk about what we've seen in PR, PRPA's IRPs from their listening session and their portfolio sharing so far. We're gonna talk about other ways to plan. And we're gonna talk about opportunities for improved alignment of BRPA's planning with community and board goals, or what I'm a section I'll call habits of highly successful planners. Uh, so let's talk about the process. I'll talk some. Uh, you can use uh, the chat box to communicate with each other or with everyone. You can use questions to file uh, your questions, like I said, that other people will be looking at. Um, in fact, I see, you know, I see, let's see, one, I'm the only one that isn't seeing slides. Okay, actually, uh, organizers, give me a chat response. Are you seeing my slides? This one being on webinar process right now, just to make sure. Yes, Carl. Good. Looks good. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, good. Good. Uh, that was worth checking, and I'm glad I did because it'd be crazy me talking into the void and you not seeing what I'm talking about. Uh, so the question and answers work, and uh, the moderators will curate, continue to curate questions and take care of things for folks. So um, that's good. 
So let me uh, go back to my slides here and we'll keep moving along. Let's talk about utility system planning. I'm gonna talk from a very high level. Um, the first thing and the most important thing I gotta tell you from having done utility planning processes to writing rules, regulations, and statutes about utility planning to reviewing utility plans from across the country and, uh, and over a wide expanse of time is that it's hard work. It's complicated. Um, it's impossible to get right because reality tends to interfere with all of our predictions. Uh, there's probably a Yogi Bear quote in here somewhere that says, planning is hard, especially for the future. Um, so um, we have to have a huge amount of respect for those who are tasked with the job, are those who are tasked with reviewing and implementing plans, and additionally and importantly, with those who take their time, like you are tonight, to sit down and learn about it, think about it, and to participate in it in all the ways that you can. Um, what do utility planners have to do? Well, planners are managers. Utility folks manage the utility on behalf of the shareholders, in your case, the communities that, that make up the Platte River Power Authority and invest their hard-earned money through rates and other investment. Uh, the use of your capital, your borrowing uh, power. Um, the utility's first priority then is to translate the policy given to them by policymakers into planning priorities. So the first thing you should ask when you look at what PRPA or any other utility says it's doing is, are they doing what the policymakers said they should be do? Uh, should be doing. Uh, second. Does the planning actually engage these people? There's a term I love, cybernetic feedback, uh, meaning that there are feedback loops and good planners build feedback loops and stepwise processes with feedback checks uh, all along the process to make sure they don't deviate. Planning has a tendency to become an echo chamber. Uh, you'll sit around in a room, I remember doing this with the executive team at Austin Energy, you sit around and you've got your consultants there and they tell you what they think is possible and which way you ought to go and you want to get this thing done. And if you don't open the door in that room and check in with people every now and then, pretty soon you start getting focused on let's just get this thing done or let's get this thing done in the way that causes us the least amount of pain. Um, and in that regard, you might be missing some of that original, uh, those original objectives. So um, third, and now we're getting into some of the details, um, you have to forecast the future. It's a guess, it's better than a crystal ball, but it shouldn't just be an extrapolation using the formula for the curve of the historical line. You have to look out at what's going on in your community that you serve as a utility and make a reasonable estimate about where this is going. Um, I noticed somebody put a quick question in here about what's my relationship with PRPA? I don't have one. Um, I, I was brought into this project uh, by the folks from Northern Colorado and the, you know, the Partners in Climate Action and asked to look at what PRPA is doing. Um, so I, I know of them and I've read a lot about them but I'm not, uh, I don't have a business relationship. Back to my list of bullets. The fourth one is you have to look at the options. So in a simple sense, you know, on the one hand, you've got, what do we need? And on the other hand, you've got, how do we meet, how can we meet the need? And a plan tries to match those up. Importantly, the plan also increasingly should be integrated. Meaning instead of just coming up with a perfect match, what you're trying to do is actually integrate your solutions. And that's especially, again, fifth bullet, with an internalization of the policy targets of the policy leaders. To do that, we use models. Uh, been a lot of talk about models around COVID. Um, they are indispensable. They are the only thing we have for putting together scenarios and stories about the future. Um, you have to do them. They differ in their structure, they differ in how they operate. Um, no one model is perfect by definition. 
Uh, so it's often good to avail yourself not only of a healthy critical attitude toward the complicated models that you work with, but also to a look at simple versions that other people might offer that could give you additional insights and the chance to check your work against things like alternative plans, the next bullet, um, or modifications of your initial plans, stochastic and sensitivity analyses. That means throwing random variables at the model within range, of course, and seeing how it performs, if it does anything weird, or if generally the, the results are consistent with what uh, common sense and expert judgment will tell you. And then finally, you have to do this modeling thing for everyone because when you're a utility, you, you are always calling on someone else to pay the tab. It shows up in rates. It shows up in the impact on the credit rating of the communities that are invested and even the credit rating of the authority itself. So stakeholder and policymaker interaction with the results of the planning process is just as important, not just at the end, but at the start, as I said before. Okay, so like I said, it's hard and there's a lot to do. Hopefully we can get to some of the core concepts about how it works a little later. So what's the IRP process? Well, the US Department of Energy gives us this chart, which says you start with your forecast, as I said, you go through scenario identification, you insert your cost assumptions. There's a lot of mischief done in cost assumptions. And there's a lot of um, well-intentioned behavior as well. And sometimes the lines cross uh, because it very much is, as you've all heard about computers, uh, garbage in, garbage out. If you presume stupid numbers, you will get stupid results. Uh, it's, yeah, but if you, pres if you presume brilliant numbers or a range of numbers, you will get brilliant results or a range of results that you can then use in your analyses. You then stick all that in the model. Like I said, you come up with costs because costs is what utilities uh, ultimately run on. And like I said, somebody's got to pay the bill. You do that stochastic modeling where you throw those random variables at the model, see how it changes. Then you do um, risk adjusted portfolio costs, meaning you actually say, well, what if, what if the cost of gas is much higher? What if the, co the cost of solar keeps falling and falls faster? What if we have a climate emergency and a climate carbon tax is passed in Congress? Um, and then finally, you identify, at least for the first few years of your plan, your preferred portfolio section, because you gotta come back and do this every few years to make sure that it still holds up. That's the textbook version. I'm sure it was designed by an engineer, but all you engineers out there, thank you for your good work. But it's pretty linear and it's not exactly reality. Reality says that in each stage of this process, every time you get a run, you get an output, you get a, you get a report, somebody's gonna look at it and say, I need to go back a few steps. Um, when people come out with the portfolio costs like PRPA has for its four portfolios, some of those numbers strike some people as being just fine. For others, they seem a little out of uh, the scope of reality and deserve some, closer attention that what that is is people asking for those feedback loops um, and planners know this they know they're going to take that feedback and they're going to look hard at their initial assumptions if they're doing this right and see if some adjustments are warranted um, i will tell you that there are bad irps and i've seen utilities do uh, irps where they put their information out there and then they build a moat around it, a wall around it, and other defensive uh, uh, structures, and they fight off anybody who challenges uh, what they've come up with step by step. It's a kind of a human behavior. Uh, we take pride in our work. We work hard to get results. And some people sort of respond by circling the wagons. Uh, the best planning processes I've seen, however, open themselves up to feedback loops, open themselves up to stakeholders. Uh, it's an investment of time, yes, but it pays off in the end. 
So reality checks is what stakeholders can give you and what careful review of your results can provide. So let's take a poll question here. I've got my poll and I'll set up the polling question and give everybody a chance to submit their response. Um, here it is. Let's launch that poll and we can start gathering some feedback. Thinking about the world today then, as you get introduced to this topic, what do you think electric utility planning should address? Please select one or more of the following. So reducing climate change, impacts, reducing spending and investment costs, taking advantage of innovative technologies, increasing electrification of transportation and heating, or all of the above. Let me give you a minute to answer the question while I get a drink of water. Oh, I see the numbers coming in. All right, this is this is exciting. I've never done this polling thing before. Uh, big shout to Kress and to Kirsten at Kress for saying you ought to try this and that it won't be hard. And she was right. Um, so uh, this is kind of fun. I'm going to watch and see if the numbers settle down a little bit here. Uh, we've been going for a minute and 15. I'm going to give it another 30 seconds for you to voice your opinion. And um, then we'll uh, move to the next step. Okay, 15 seconds. All right. I'm okay, I'm closing it now. Um, and I'm back. Uh, obviously, this is not a poll designed to come up with the right answer, um, but rather to sort of kind of uh, get the motors running inside your brain boxes as well, thinking about um, what you would be asking for if you were in the, the hot seat of being the policymaker. Because in fact, if you're a customer of PRPA, one of the communities, uh, live in one of the communities, uh, you are in the hot seat. You have a choice, and and not surprisingly, um, while folks have expressed some priorities around climate, innovative technology, and electrification, the you know the big winner is we got to do all this stuff at the same time. My dad's favorite saying was, "You got to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time." Um, that's that is the reality. We have to not trade off the three priorities, the three directives that PRPA has. We have to maximize performance against all three. Um, and that's what we do on our kitchen tables with our household budgets. That's what we have to do with our utility, electric utility service as well. All right, so in the field of planning, however, nothing is static. As I said, over the past 120 years or so, the industry has changed dramatically in a lot of places, except maybe Alabama, but that's a whole nother discussion. Um, what has changed is really what's driving the need for better planning. The first is carbon. Uh, I am amazed. I've been thinking about carbon. I, when I was the first a public utility commissioner in 1993, sorry, it was a long time ago, 34-year-old um, guy just out of the Army, I, um, I heard about this thing called the Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Rio Conference. And I hand signed a letter to every utility executive and public power general manager uh, in the state of Texas. I said, I heard about this climate change thing. It seems to me this will impact rates and electric service. What are you doing about it? It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, um, some of the utilities said, well, if the weather gets hotter, we'll sell more electricity. So we'll prepare to build more power plants. Um, one utility, that um, happens to be part of now a three-state utility and uh, that was operating then in the Panhandle and still operates in the Panhandle of Texas, actually wrote me a letter back and said, you don't even have the authority to ask this question. It was, it was kind of funny. Um, 
And uh, I got calls from the governor's office and other places. And uh, still we published the results. And I thought, I hoped that this thing might become a planning priority. I can tell you that now it clearly is. Um, we have to figure out how to be carbon free. PRPA recognizes it. The communities that are served by PRPA recognize it. Um, the board recognizes it. So it's a question of how, and it's happened. If you think about it, not maybe as quick as some people would like, but pretty amazingly fast, one guy's career. Um, we also have begun to recognize, and this is phenomenal to me, that it took this long. Um, we've, uh, oh, there, okay, there's the poll results. Results. You can look at those while we're talking. Um, that it's not just assume demand and then build a power system to suit it. Actually, what we can do is we can change demand just like we change the supply solutions that we use to meet the requirement for electricity service. Um, this has always been true in economics, but it is really coming home as we've begun to, to enjoy the experience of energy efficiency, demand response, better buildings, smarter grid controls, demand control, demand management, is just as much a resource as building a power plant. In fact, it's a more affordable one, it's a more equitable one, and it has it pays bonus benefits like higher job numbers. Uh, it outperforms the supply side every time. Uh, that's finally coming through and in really coming through with a lot of utility managers as well. Um, we have more resources than we had before. You just, when I was started in the utility business, you built a gas plant, or you built a coal plant, or you built a nuke. Um, we put the first wind farm in when I was in, in uh, Texas as a public utility commissioner in 1994, uh, it, and that was only on a trial basis. Today, we talk about wind farms that are tiny and giant, we talk about solar farms that are the same. We've got CH combined heat and power experience. So we have a lot more resources on this one hand to meet all this demand and to integrate with that demand. The things that are clean have gotten less expensive. I won't use the word cheap because I think cheap cheapens the value. Um, but the resources we want to depend on are much less expensive. The prices are falling. And they're falling even faster when they operate together. So the combo of the solar is less expensive, dramatically less expensive than it was just even five years ago. But the combo of solar and storage is just breaking down barriers everywhere. Uh, batteries are cheaper than peakers. Batteries are cheaper than gas peakers. Um, and I'm sorry, I said cheaper, less expensive. Uh, more valuable actually to the grid than a power plant with uncertain and variable fuel costs. And the finally, the electricity sector has the potential to eliminate direct combustion entirely. I mentioned this earlier on, but we now have the technologies necessary to electrify transmission at all sizes, from semi trucks down to uh, the e bikes that my wife and I now have in our garage here in Denver. Um, we have the potential. I got rid of the gas range in my kitchen, so we wouldn't have combustion gases in the kitchen, and so I wouldn't have a hot kitchen when I cooked. My new induction oven is fantastically precise, um, and uh, with a subscription to a green power, because I have a nicely shaded roof, I can run it on renewable energy. We can run our lives on renewable energy uh, increasingly, and there is reasonable demand that we do so. What still needs to change? We still are doing most of our planning with old models, old models that were developed for a very different kind of utility industry, mostly focused around large central station and bringing resources in in large chunks. The common models, Aurora, Aegeus, uh, ProSim, 
uh, strategists. These are brand names of models that are sold to utilities. Most can handle renewable energy in sizes less than 50 megawatts. Uh, that's thousands of homes uh, worth of electricity. We're talking uh, 50 megawatts is the equivalent of 50,000 kilowatts. And most homes can run with five to 10 kilowatts at the most. So the model is not designed and not capable of operating at the level of the resolution that the solutions are coming. In addition, the models run on the idea of this bus bar resources dispatchability. These are the resources that utility managers like because they, you can control them. They're easier to manage than solar, which only works when the sun shines, um, and wind that works when the wind blows. Uh, and so these turn them on when you want them resources get a winning spot in traditional models. In addition, those models were not built with the idea of the infrastructure needed to serve them in mind. Uh, here's a key point I experienced. I, when I was a public utility commissioner, we had to vote in the Comanche Peak nuclear power plant, a couple thousand megawatts of generation in Glen Rose, Texas, one of the last, if not the last, uh, nuclear power plant to come online. Um, Maybe there's been one or two since. It came online uh, 20 years after it was originally approved, 17 times the cost originally proposed. And we didn't even have the transmission to connect it to all the places it was gonna serve. The transmission, uh, the power plant ended up costing about $12.5 billion, talk about a rate hike. Um, the transmission to serve it cost another three and a half billion dollars, and it wasn't even approved until over a year later. That's the way we used to do it. We used to build the power plants, um, and then we do transmission as an afterthought. But transmission has gotten very expensive, and it takes longer to build transmission than it does solar or wind farms. Um, so now we have to have models that integrate transmission planning when we decide on the generation and check against the cost of transmission before we choose a resource. Most of the models don't do that. They assume whatever, they figure out whatever power plant is gonna come out of the model, and then they add on the transmission. They also do it with demand side management and often with distributed generation as well. So they're not truly integrated, um, they just use assumptions. And a lot of those assumptions are black box assumptions. They're bought from services, they're treated as confidential, they're not shared with stakeholders um, or anybody else, sometimes even if you're willing to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And they are finally unfriendly to big data because they have to do a lot of calculations. Uh, computers have moved beyond that. We have models now that can handle big data uh, and that's kind of important for renewable energy future. More on that in a minute. Most of our planning doesn't integrate our resource options. It doesn't do that. It just does that. It tries to match resources to that forecast of demand. Um, it doesn't do the small scale. It doesn't include stakeholders. And most planning is still heavily tilted towards the predetermined outcomes. But that can change. Okay, let me take a break for any questions that folks might have. Um, just to check in and see if there's any questions on that section before we move on. So let me see, I'll look, I'll do some scanning and uh, maybe my uh, organizers can also, let's see, uh, quick tops are the way to go, yes. <laughs> sure, Carl, if you wanted to answer any of now, you can feel free, if not, then. We've got uh, plenty of time for the Q and A. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, let me see. There is a there is a point here, and 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 by the way, I am. Um, this is a. I love this kind of comment slash question. Uh, it says, you know, somebody said to, to have. Uh, Brent Nelson said, to say that batteries are cheaper than peakers is incomplete. They have different durations and play different roles in reliability. Absolutely, that's an excellent point. Uh, it's part of the complication that planners have to deal with. It is true that on a levelized cost of energy basis, 
increasingly lithium ion batteries are less expensive than gas peakers. It has to do with the fact that you spend uh, money on a gas peaker and you run it only for a few hundred hours. So you have to spread its costs over very few hours and that uh, batteries are similarly expensive and you try to make your money off of a few hours, but batteries can only be cycled so many times and for so long. As my grandson found out today, playing with my one of my uh, battery powered uh, little handheld devices, uh, when the battery ran out, we had to go plug it back in. So uh, you do have to look at all these parameters. Um, what we're finding though, and, and, and to me, it is amazing that batteries have moved as far as they can. And the hard thing for planners is figured out where they're going because the prices are continuing to fall while the prices of gas speakers are continuing to go up. More importantly, one of the things that's, that's happening on our grid of generally across the country is while peak demand, the highest use during any particular time segment, the day, the month, the year, is getting higher among a lot of utilities, the tools for reducing peak are increasing and the peaks are getting skinnier, um, meaning that they are lending themselves to being addressed by technologies like batteries better than by gas peakers in many, many utility uh, service territories and many parts of utility service territories. So planners have to account for the trends of the technology and the trends of the forecast and the demand in trying to figure out what resources will best match with the shape that they forecasted. So thank you, Brent, is a really, really good point. Um, somebody mentioned that EVs have the ability to made made V to grid. So I just read it, I just read a, a, a tweet today. Somebody dismantled the Tesla Model 3 and found out that every single one of them is already pre-wired for the electricity to flow from the car back to the grid. Now, it raises a question of whether the charging stations or the EVSE, the electric vehicle servicing equipment, is also capable of accepting electricity flowing from the car. But I had a Volt for five years. It was not wired to flow back uh, to the grid but every Tesla Model 3 is, meaning that we have mobile storage becoming a part of our society everywhere. Um, that's pretty exciting when you think about it. So, um, and I, I will tell you, I, I put in a public charging network in Austin and, um, and did a lot of work on electric vehicle infrastructure. The opportunity for timing of electric vehicle use to smooth out the bumps, attack those peaks in demand is astounding. Um, the ability to follow the grid, to take messages and signals from the larger grid and time the charging as well as discharging to provide what they call ancillary services has been demonstrated for years and now just needs to be kind of connected and thought about. Now, don't get me wrong you have to make sure the car batteries and the usage patterns are all squared away. But the fact is there's a lot of electricity sitting there on the hoof, if you will, uh, ready to be turned into opportunities. So, hey, uh, hey, Carl. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Josh here, sorry about that. I, I had a uh, technical issue, so I had to close my screen. So I, I can uh, go through some of these questions and ask them um, if you'd like and uh, ease up some of that responsibility on your ends. Um, would that be okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. Anything that stands out and then we'll move on to the next section. Yeah, sure. Um, there is one. Is, is there a utility that is currently setting a national standard for the best practice uh, in resource planning? Um, that you know of? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good one. Um, there is a, a utility out there if you sort of uh, took Frankenstein-like pieces and parts from all over the place. Um, so there are some places that are doing a really good job of energy efficiency, for example. Um, uh, Austin Energy uh, does a really good job of that. They've got a strong program, they've got strong goals, 
they take it right off the top and integrate the, the solutions into their planning and ask how they can push the levers a little bit further. Um, they also integrate a lot of technologies. They've invested in district heating, and like I said, the electric vehicles and energy efficiency. Um, uh, the Con Ed in New York has done a phenomenal job of, of integrating energy efficiency planning into their, their DSIPs, their distribution system implementation plans. Um, Commonwealth Edison in Chicago is doing a great job thinking about distributed energy resources in general, as is SEMPRA in San Diego a bit uh, uh, as well. They've figured a lot of this out because there's so much rooftop solar there. So um, right now, the superstar doesn't immediately come to mind, uh, but there are pieces everywhere. Oh my goodness, I almost forgot. As a state, uh, Minnesota is also doing some fantastic planning. Uh, it started several years ago, but it's really taking root now. And it's integrating the work of Excel in Minnesota, but also Minnesota Power and other utilities uh, working together. All right, thank you so much. Um, you you can proceed. Okay, so let's get back to this thing. Let's talk about what we've seen in the PA IRP so far. Um, and please, please understand, with this and with the whole thing, I, I started with huge respect for the task in front of these people. I wanna point out some of the things though that, that opportunities, if you will, for improvement to make things uh, better. So, so far we know they're doing it because WAPA requires it. It's also just generally what uh, utilities and power providers should do. So uh, they will cover the years 21 through 25 with a action plan and then roll it out to 2040 in the IRP. Um, that's a little issue of concern right at the very start. Uh, 20 years is not a long time for a plan, um, especially since resources like things like natural gas power plants can last 60 years, right? 40 to 60 years. Um, coal plants in some places have lasted easily that long. So um, while the IRP rolls out to 2040, you got to make sure that the modeling and the analysis of resources goes out that far, as goes out as far as the resources do as well. Shoot, every solar panel sold pretty much in the United States today comes with a 25 year warranty. So the, if you install any kind of solar today, um, it's gonna go out to 2045. Um, that's five years of additional performance and potential benefits that should be reflected in the plan uh, and not ignored or automatically curtailed. And then of course it's working on the resource diversification policy, but the plans that PRPA, the portfolio options that PRPA has given us, don't all do that. Um, it is true that there's inertia in planning and in running a utility. It's inertia because it's where the budgets are, it's where the staffing is, it's where the jobs are that you want to protect, it's where your friends are if you've been at the utility a long time. Um, and when it comes to the resources at PRPA, there's a lot of inertia in fossil fuels. It's providing a huge amount of the capacity, effective capacity, and a huge amount of the energy as of today. It's changing fat rapidly um, with commitments that the board and the communities have made. But um, where you stand often does depend on where you sit. And some of this, uh, you have to take a really hard look at what your planning is when, um, when this is where you're planning from. Um, so the, by the way, the, the sort of the numbers out here uh, on the side of the graphic uh, also show that um, while this is going to change shortly with the retirement of Craig, uh, the coal plant, um, PRPA is also substantially overbuilt. Um, part of that is the nature of these resources. Part of it is the difficulty of predicting exactly what's gonna happen. But you need to take a grain of salt with your resource plans because um, things don't turn out the way you do. There's a graph in the, in the uh, PRPA's briefing that shows us quite clearly that electricity consumption has been flat for several years. It's been, that, it's been flat for a decade pretty much everywhere in the United States. Um, so if you planned for growth and build power plants for it, you will soon find yourself with what some people call stranded or potentially stranded assets. What's also true about the old big resources is that they, they're chumpy, they're lumpy. 
they you can't buy a coal plant in less than a couple hundred megawatts and really the economics don't get really favorable until they're much higher than that uh, gas turbines and combustion cycle co uh, combined cycle uh, generators uh, come in the around 100 megawatt size maybe a little bit smaller in some cases but um, you're there's a big risk of overshoot when you're solving your problems with what are called utility scale resources. It's also true of renewables. Uh, large wind farms are less expensive than small wind farms. Large solar farms are less expensive than small solar installations. But right sizing your resources to more carefully fit your load or to the load you need to fill in is a much more economical, financially and economically sustainable path than a, than a pattern of overshoot and then catch up and overshoot and catch up. So um, that needs to show up. Here are the four scenarios. I'm not gonna go into them in great detail because later on I'm gonna share with you some insights about good planning that draw on some of the, um, I'll say, potential weaknesses or flaws in the planning uh, that I've seen from in PRPA's plan so far. Again, opportunities to improve uh, and to make the plan more robust and more in line with what I think we're seeing in terms of the economics and performance of technology and resource options. But the, but the, they are here, continuity in some states, they call this the business as usual plan. It in no way serves the resource uh, uh, diversification goals of the board. It just says, this is what happens if we continue. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. Uh, but it is business as usual uh, in, in its continuity, not necessarily in a good use of the term. It's continuity like saying, you know, um, how's your marriage? Oh, it's sustainable. It's continuous. You know, well, sometimes we want a little more. Uh, and in fact, the board has already said that, uh, you know, with the conditions that it imposed. Zero coal pushes rawhide. Uh, Craig retires and rawhide has to close by the start of 2030, the end of 29, and then uses and maintains a large amount of gas to uh, add in uh, and adds in renewables. Uh, it achieves about a 95 or 90%, I'm sorry, 90% carbon reduction by the 2030 timeframe, not quite the goal. Um, the zero carbon closes those gas plants down and goes all the way to 100%. And um, then fills in with an awful lot of storage. There's storage in the, the, the P2 scenario as well. The thing about the zero carbon idea is that, uh, and portfolio is, is of course that it's, um, it's, it's kind of extreme. <laughs> it's in a sense, it's, uh, there is this thing in, in technology planning or resource planning or, uh, uh, or in business planning called an S curve. Uh, it basically shows you when you first start out, you, you spend a lot of money, but you don't get a lot of benefit. Then you reach this inflection point at the hockey stick and things start taking off and the business is really humming and, and then things start petering out. Um, somewhere around 95, maybe 96%, uh, maybe around that point, uh, everybody across the country planning for zero carbon is finding that the costs start increasing dramatically. So if you choose 100% carbon free by a date as soon as 2030, it is ambitious, but it is likely to get you the very highest cost you can possibly get. And it is um, potentially unrealistic because all it can really do is project today's technologies onto that future in 2030. Um, and it ignores because we simply don't know what we don't know is, as of the unknown unknowns, as Donald Rumsfeld would have said, uh, of technology improvements and usage changes. So in planning for something out in 2030, it's best to keep uh, some options open. Um, and I'm a little concerned that the zero carbon plan um, is extreme because it doesn't. It doesn't foreclose, it doesn't keep those options open. It decides uh, based on today. and. For all we know, we could be in the Stone Age in energy technology compared to what will be available really, really just 10 years from now. 
The P4 uses the term integrated utilities. Um, I'm not sure I understand the term, but it keeps rawhide open, kicks the closure of rawhide out by an additional, I think, six years or maybe more. Um, I'm, I don't have the data right in front of me. Um, and then it adds in uh, more renewables and storage. Um, two things you need to watch for, uh, and this, is, this will come up later but as well, but the term least cost. Um, that one needs definition anytime it's used. Is it the least short-term cost? Is it the least long-term cost? Is it the least life cycle cost? Is it the least cost in terms of wholesale rates? Or is it the least cost in terms of impacts to society? What is the least cost term? And, and um, businesses and utilities typically have an internal definition of least cost, but it becomes especially important in planning when you're considering all these options to make sure that you're absolutely clear with everybody, that everybody understands when you say you're continuing to meet demand with least cost resources, for example, what exactly do you mean? What exactly do you mean? Okay, so um, let me get into some of the details. The, the PRPA is starting to share some, has started to share some really interesting studies, but they're a little myopic. Um, you'll see that as I go through some of the specific ones. They have an economic impact study they commissioned some folks at the university to do, but they only they only, the, their analysis was, what if wholesale rates go up? What impact does that have on society? Well, that's like, what if the cost of hamburger goes up? What if the cost of gasoline goes up? What if the cost of ice cream goes up? Um, if the cost of that goes up all by itself, uh, um, it will have some impact on us. If the cost of wholesale electricity goes up, it will have even more impact because electricity is used for so many things. But Let's put some things in perspective. First of all, even a doubling of wholesale prices, according to the study, uh, says that it would only have a 1% negative impact. And there was no analysis of the benefits <coughs> of clean renewable energy, increased distributed energy resources and energy efficiency, excuse me. Um, we know there are more jobs in energy efficiency than renewable energy. There are more jobs in renewable energy than in fossil energy. So you're likely to see increased spending power, take home pay in a cleaner, more distributed energy system. Uh, that has to be estimated as part of the economic impact of the planning effort. Um, there is um, also increasingly important is that this analysis was done pre-COVID. And uh, a lot of things have changed. And as much as we'd like them to go back to normal, they are not gonna ever probably go back to pre-COVID. Um, excuse me, one second. That's what I get for talking. I'm gonna try to keep it down to a low rumble. Um, so we better start paying attention to that and it'll be worth doing an update. A lot of utilities are uh, based on how COVID is impacting things. One data point I saw recently from a, an investment firm, work at home went from 4% to 50% in the space of one month because of COVID. Um, but the expectation is that we'll never go back to less than 25% by many analysts. So what happens when 20% increase in at-home work happens. What does that do to the shape and level of residential and commercial load? Um, assuming we can go back to coffee shops and that's where we all choose to work or whatever, uh, there's a lot to be understood. So I can't imagine it at all, but it, there it is. Um, the studies include a DER potential study, but um, remarkably, this study was also very wholesale generator specific. No distribution system benefits were analyzed. Um, it added the private investment costs for distributed resources to uh, the cost of the, uh, uh, to de distributed energy resource costs in general, making them look more expensive. On this, I gotta tell you a quick story just cause um, it's one of my favorites. 
many years ago when I first came to Denver, I was working for CH2M Hill down in um, almost the tech center. They're not in their new building now, but um, back when they were over by Orchard. And I remember riding to work one day, listening to somebody do an interview um, on the radio about their solar. Uh, somebody in Ken Carroll Ranch had installed solar on their rooftop and they had spent an ungodly amount of money. I mean, I think it was like $100,000 for the solar system on their rooftop. This was many years ago. Um, and the, the, the reporter was, was sitting there with the owner of the home on the couch and saying, well, sir, how can you justify spending $100,000 on a solar system? And the guy was wonderful. It was right there on the on Colorado Public Radio. He, he says, ma'am, you're sitting on a $9,000 couch. Do I seem like someone who's sensitive to costs? Well, okay, well, that's not how we live, uh, most of us. But um, thank goodness for people like that because they help drive the cost of solar down for everyone else. But um, the point is, what a private customer invests in these distributed resources is a help to utility system costs, not a cost. It's cost that the utility and all the other customers get to avoid. Uh, so you don't add it in to make those resources look more expensive. You consider them private investors, and that's a better way to do the math. Um, the study also inflates the cost and assumes that everything in the distributed energy resource space that PRPA does comes with a 35% administrative cost level, and that's just too high. Uh, and then finally, it finds no cost-effective potential for distributed generation at all. It does a study of energy storage technology, but only the big stuff. In fact, only three kinds of big stuff. Um, pump storage, which is not feasible realistically anywhere within the service territory. Unproven vanadium flow batteries, uh, which even the study says are not ready for prime time, and a lithium ion battery in the 400 megawatt scale, which is huge. Um, didn't look at behind the meter storage or coupled with distributed solar. So there's an opportunity here to look more closely at those distributed resources and integrate them into the planning. There are also studies on rawhide coal cycling to try to improve its ability to follow variable loads like solar and wind. It's not clear how that shows up in the IRP. I'd like to know more. Um, the thermal gas generation study, yes, but no life cycle analysis of those resources is included in that study that I saw. A resource adequacy, do we have enough generation for supply? But really it's only focused on the major coal units, the large wind and very large solar resources. Again, there are a host of distributed resources. Got to work with the communities more, but it's appropriate. And and in this regard, I'm, I've said it a bunch of times, I wanna hammer it home, right? I know that once upon a time, the way we did co-ops with G&Ts, generation and transmission, or the, with the structure like PRPA, where you've got a, a utility authority that serves uh, you know, commun individual community utilities, we used to draw a bright line between utility scale and distribution. It technologically doesn't make any sense anymore for one thing, but here's a really important business proposition for you. If PRPA doesn't start thinking about how it can do a lot more in the distributed and distribution space in partner with its member communities, then it is a business in liquidation, right? Because distributed resources are taking over more and more and more, and our homes and Buildings are getting more and more efficient. And distributed resources have a very real potential to, to marginalize, significantly reduce over coming decades, the need for and reliance on utility scale resources. The best and highest use of PRPA, it seems to me, would be as an integrated energy services provider, not just a utility scale supplier. So that's just a little preachy, but. Also life cycle assessment, a um, lot of numbers in there and it's really cool and I love life cycle assessments. Uh, my first peer reviewed scientific article ever was a, was a life cycle assessment um, for a plastic made out of corn. But this one gives you a host of different values that you can't really compare and it's not clear how they're integrated into the IRP. So more work needs to be done there to take that great research 
by some additional professors and students and help the IRP with it. And then finally, there's a great technology review. If you want to read about all the ways to make electricity, I encourage you to read them. Unfortunately, there's no forecasts of where the prices are going or detailed numbers. So <coughs> let's have a pause and I can drink some more water. I want to queue up a second polling question real quick here and ask you whether you personally feel that the amounts and types of information that PRPA has provided about its planning processes so far has been just right, way too much, not enough, not the right kind, um, or not explained well, or that you have no opinion, or that you just need to learn more. So let me cue this one up, we'll launch the poll. Uh, it seems to be starting now. Let's take a minute and 45 seconds. I'll get some water and you can answer the question. Okay, we're about a minute in, spend another 30, 45 seconds uh, casting your vote. <clears throat> I'm also finding a couple of great questions here. Okay, just jotting down some notes. Uh, <clears throat> All right. All right, folks, uh, wrap it up here and uh, I'm gonna close the poll. Yeah, let's see what people have said. Uh, okay, this audience, which is not a random sample, of course, has some pretty definite opinions. Um, first of all, they're not sure they have the right, enough of, of information uh not the right kind of information or feel like it hasn't been explained well to them but they're not leaving the game <laughs> 34 percent of people still want to learn more whether and maybe they want to learn more and they don't have one of those other opinions um so um you have the right attitude uh this is a learning process and a continuing learning process at that it evolves just like the technologies evolve and like the the, the policy framework evolves so um I also would say this is a bit of a lesson here to the board uh, of PRPA and the, and the municipal uh, utilities that um, there's always an opportunity to improve communication. It's one of the hardest things about this business. All right, um, let's dive in for a couple of questions. While you were answering the poll, I looked at a couple of them. Somebody said, well, how do you sort through all this? How do you get everybody in the room together and address these issues? Are there good processes? Um, Yes, there are. There are improvements on the processes. You can structure this process very formally. Um, you know, I am the utility. Uh, there's a there's a um, a joke somebody did many many years ago that said, you know, I am the utility. I have energy. You want it, so be quiet. You know, the, uh, utilities don't do that. PRPA isn't doing that. The question is whether or not they have meaningful opportunities for engagement. Early in the planning processes for our for for climate action plans, a lot of communities did what we call charrettes, uh, put people together in rooms, treated everybody equally and respectfully, spread uh, utility or municipal uh, people around all over the place, uh, gave the officials training and how to be effective participants in discussion groups, 
and then uh, crafted plans and ideas for plans at that level, handing it off then to the planners to incorporate in what they came up with. So I'm a real fan of those. I'm also, as you might have guessed from the earlier part of the session, a real fan of feedback loops. Ask, listen, show how you incorporated the feedback. Um, so um, those, those things help and do it a lot. Take your time, do it right. Most of these decisions um, have some lead time on them. The utility has done, PRPA has done a great job making sure you have enough electricity. Um, the lights are not gonna go out tomorrow. The cities are doing their job as well. Um, so take the time to do the planning and get people engaged and watch out for the blind spots. The second thing somebody asked about is, so, so, or a comment is, don't forget opportunity costs. My God, this is, that is so important. Thank you, Alan. Um, opportunity costs is an economic concept. It means that if you decide to spend money on one thing, that money won't be available to spend on something else. Uh, nuclear power is my, my favorite example of, of opportunity costs. Uh, uh, you know, for 16 cents a kilowatt hour, you can get nuclear power that will then cost you only a penny per kilowatt hour. But for 16 cents, a kil uh, 16 cents you can buy 16 units of energy efficiency. That's the opportunity cost uh, uh, of spending 16 cents on nuclear power. And you can just take those numbers and turn them into anything you want to, billions, um, tens of billions. Uh, no, it's just the billions right now. Um, so you have to not just ask what you're getting for your money, but what you're not getting, or what you have cut yourself off from getting. This is also the, the problem. There's a, one of the plan scenarios from PRPA that worries me a little bit is that um, they're proposing what's called a rice unit, which is a nice term for a, a reciprocating piston engine, a reciprocating internal combustion engine. Um, that would be run on fossil fuels, probably natural gas. That plant is proposed out in the late 20s, uh, 2029, I believe it is. There's no reason to commit your planning to a unit like that right now. You're going to have lots of opportunities to get that peaking power in 2029. You could put in a generic placeholder that you need some peaking capacity, but deciding on that kind of technology basically blocks out a lot of other things that you might be willing to look at. And that leads, um, that leads to another question. Somebody said, how do, you, how do you figure, how do you deal with the unknown unknowns? How do you model what hasn't been invented? And, 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 and again, I'll repeat that answer. A lot of planners use generic blocks. They figure out what do they really have to do right away. And then they leave generic placeholders in out of years of the plan. And it's important to mention that because while that's a good thing to do in terms of not boxing yourself into a technology, as I said with that rice unit, um, you also have to be careful not to backload all your plans. There's a whole lot of people that, 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 that are doing in the utility space now are doing plans that say, you know, um, our goal is 2035. Um, we're going to do business as usual until 2034 and then a miracle. You know, uh, and it's like a, the economist on the stranded on the desert island, you know, he says, first, imagine a boat, you know, well, you don't get to do that, right? Um, so you got to have to start taking action and ask yourself, what are your near, what, how does your near term action set you up for what you want to, might want to do in the future? One final example there, when I, <clears throat> I ran a hydrogen research lab at, at the Houston Advanced Research Center and ran the hydrogen program at the U.S. Department of Energy. And um, hydrogen is very interesting in many, many ways. It's an energy carrier. Think of it like a battery. Um, but how to make your hydrogen is the critical question. And right now, most hydrogen is made from natural gas. You just break up the CH4. You add the C to some oxygen and make CO2, yes. And then you have some hydrogen. Um, there's some people who said, well, we shouldn't do hydrogen if you're ever gonna make it from natural gas. But the truth is that you can actually do a certain amount of hydrogen infrastructure and hydrogen using technologies on natural gas today if you figure out and start planning how to do the transition later on. And you know, a hydrogen vehicle or a hydrogen 
engine doesn't care where its hydrogen comes from and there's problems to be solved. A hydrogen filling station doesn't care where its hydrogen comes from, but there's some safety and management and operation issues we have to work out. So we don't have to wait until we can make all our hydrogen with renewable energy before we figure out the rest of our hydrogen technology options. And I, I would support a certain amount of research in hydrogen at the US Department of Energy level and in demonstration projects around the country. Last thing I wanna mention in question terms is um, somebody said, well, how does real-time pricing help? And, and this is an important point. Rates are a resource just like batteries and power plants because races ha rates have the ability to, rate ha rates have the ability and tariffs have the ability to modify the way we use energy. Now, you have to be careful with them. There are some people who don't have a lot of freedom of movement. They're using just what they need. They can't afford to use less. Um, you have to understand your customers really, really well. But you can use rates, for example, that um, give you a rebate if you reduce your use during those expensive peaky periods. Uh, as long as the rebate is less than turning on a peaking power plant, then that rate can create a cost-effective resource in terms of customer consumption patterns. So there's an important place for it, but we need to remember equity and, or energy justice, if you will, in how rates impact people. It's always best to start with signals uh, that are and, and options that are voluntary uh, before mandating because customer education is key. So I'm gonna keep moving um, because uh, I've spent a lot of time talking already and I wanna leave more around for questions. But that was a selection of some of them I saw. I'll ask the organizers to uh, make a note of any other ones that I really should address. I want to switch now to something exciting happening. And this is coming out of that project I described, working for the Coalition for Community, so so uh, Community Solar Access. We commissioned uh, a firm in Boulder called Vibrant Clean Energy to help us do some modeling that pays attention to distributed resources. I'm going to throw some numbers at you, but they're going to be big. Uh, and they're meant to just impress uh, uh, and sort of leave you with a thought. I'm not going to get into too many details, but there's this guy, Dr. Clack, Christopher Clack, who works there at VCE, founded VCE, who had the idea that we have the ability to process really data intense um, information sets for things like weather that we might be able to use for energy. So instead of doing everything in really big chunks, we can use big data and get fine resolution. What's on the screen in front of you right now is a little bit of analysis that uses that kind of information. The first slide is wind regimes in Colorado and Wyoming. And the second slide is solar regimes. It's where the average wind speed is better, hot red, where the average solar energy is better, again, hot red. Um, and and then using that fine detail down to one square mile uh, size um, starts plotting out the transmission system and what's necessary and yields a model that takes advantage of the resources, minimizes the transmission miles, connects in the most efficient way. This, this work these guys are doing is so exciting. We said, well, we need, want to do this for the whole country. So we commissioned these studies um, and we asked them to look at DER, by the way, and the cool kids say DERs. I wanna make sure I lift, leave this slide in the deck with you. Um, I've already kind of described it, but it's all the distributed energy resources and it's a growing list. Um, and it includes, thanks to the person with that question, again, it includes things like load shaping rates and tariffs as well. Uh, so that'll be a reference for you when you get a copy of the, the slides. Traditional models, as I've described, work on the left hand of the screen here and basically do all the utility scale resources and assume they all inter intersect with the transmission grid somewhere. Um, then somebody buys them. This is kind of a PRPA centric, if you will, view uh, that ignores, of course, the fact that they're already doing help on things like DSM programs. 
but they generally don't model distribution scale. The work we're doing with the VCE, Vibrant Clean Energy, says there's a better way. In fact, the reality is that electricity flows both ways across the 69 kilovolt or the distribution uh, intersection point, that electricity flows back and forth within the distribution system, that the operations of these various resources impact each other and cause feedback loops, and that if we actually look at all those interactions, again, in a model built for big data, we can truly optimize the resources that we deploy to meet the forecasted demand. Uh, so you'd not only just add both of these circles and add the flows, but also think about how these circles interact with other circles and are affected by other circles. How does what Excel is doing impact what uh, PRPA is doing? We already know it happens at a big level. When, PR, when Excel says we're not buying electricity from that coal plant anymore, then suddenly that coal plant may not have an economic customer to sell the power to, and it changes the economics of the plant, for example. So the feedback loops are at the small scale and at the big scale. Here's what we learned when we modeled the country and asked, what do we get for the continental United States if we truly optimize distributed energy resources? Here's some of those big numbers. If you optimize the distributed energy resources, out to the year 2050, the country could save $372 billion every year on electricity. It rises every year leading up to that and reaches that level in 2050. If the world warms faster than we think, and it already is, you could save even more, another $8 billion, because distributed energy resources respond to climate change better than utility scale resources. They, uh, they don't have as much thermal energy to reject like a coal plant or a gas plant has to, for example. Um, if you pursue a 95% reduction in carbon for the entire United States out to 2050, you save even more, $417 billion. And that savings means that it not only pays for all the distributed energy resources and all the, the uh, carbon reduction, and by the way, it models the cost of retiring the power plants that you have to retire. Um, it also generates $50 billion in extra value. So optimizing distributed energy resources appears to be a really good thing to do if you care about your money. And you know the first rule about economic development, right? If you want to keep your money, don't give it all away. If you extract just Colorado, the numbers are more modest. Colorado is not a big population state. Um, so if you take the base model and you add distributed energy resources out to 2030, you save $1.5 billion Colorado-wide. And out to 2050, that number grows to $6 billion out to 2050 just by optimizing distributed energy resources. You have roughly the same amount of jobs, but it's a substantial number of jobs in clean energy, more than the status quo. And your electric rates go down by about three cents per kilowatt hour out to 2050. If you pursue a clean electricity agenda, and this is going to, these are old numbers that need to be updated for the more recent legislation. This went back to pre, we set it the baseline at pre uh, 2018 data, so we have to catch the new act. But even before that act, if you just go out to 2050, the clean electricity agenda saves money if optimizing with DER as well. Um, it's a little less because you're getting rid of that carbon, but it's not a doubling of wholesale cost. It's a savings uh, all across the board in Colorado. So. It's all I have to say about it, but just saying that there's a frontier out here, more than a frontier. There's models being developed that are showing that our portfolios may not have to cost as much, and maybe we ought to look at them, especially when those por when those portfolios could take advantage of distributed energy resources. Okay, I want to hit you with poll number, question number three now. Um, this question is that. The idea that these distributed energy resources like store, solar storage and efficiency can save money and reduce pollution is, in your opinion, 
Unbelievable, possible, but it depends on planning, management, and leadership. Still be determined or makes real sense to me. So let's um, let's kick up to the third question and uh, launch the poll, and I'll give you a minute or so to respond. What do you think about these distributed resources based on what you know? Okay, we're in a little bit over a minute here. I'll give you about oh, 30 more seconds to cast your vote. All right, I'm going to call a halt to the poll here. I'll hit close poll, share the results so you can see them on the screen. All right, well, um, I must be really good, or you actually already know some of the same things I do. I'm probably the latter <laughs> that distributed resources can save money and reduce pollution. Um, you know, it's the way nature works, uh, it's the way ecosystems work, it's the way communities work. Um, it's uh, right sizing resources does make sense. Uh, we actually wrote a book when I was at Rocky Mountain Institute called Small is Profitable, in which we cataloged 207 distinct benefits of distributed resources. I'm proud to say the book won um, the uh, Economist Magazine's Book of the Year Award the year we published it um, in back in 2002. I will also tell you that the opportunity to um, to work with and and download Amory Lovins's brain is uh, something not to be passed up on if you ever have the chance. Um, so uh, it's also true that execution matters. You know, there's a saying in venture capital that it's not enough to build a better mousetrap. You actually have to really, really, really want to kill mice. So planning, management, and leadership are critical to taking advantage of the technologies that you have in front of you in the distributed space today. Um, so let's let's get into some questions. Um, once again, I did a little quick review while we were on the break and looked at a few things and I will save some for a little bit later, but um, somebody asked about combustion, combined cycle combust, uh, gas generation. Um, combined cycle plants are plants that uh, instead of just spinning the turbine, they uh, um, what they do is that they take the waste heat at the back end and they run that through another turbine. And so you can move from a technical efficiency limit of about 36% from just burning stuff, what coal plants run on, um, and you can double it by getting the heat off the back end. And, and, and in some cases, actually, with things like combined heat and power, there are people talking about getting into the 80% factor by recovering every bit of that waste heat and turning it into useful energy. Uh, so if they're very attractive. They tend to want to run a long time, so they make a lot of kilowatt hours. They make a lot of energy. 
and they were for a long period of time the winner in this country on making cheap, low-priced energy. Um, what's happened, however, is that in recent years, wind and solar are really giving them a hard time. An increasing number of combined cycle natural gas plants are uneconomic um, because they can't compete with uh, power plants powered by wind and solar that have no fuel cost at all. Um, also, you take a big risk when you build a gas plant that could last 40, 50, 60 years. You're betting on the fuel cost every one of those years. And natural gas fuel prices have been some of the most volatile fuel prices in the energy economy. So they're facing some hard times these days and are likely to face more hard times in the future. Um, somebody also asked about. Um, Strand, a couple of comments about stranding co stranded costs I mentioned. Stranded costs is what happens when you have money spent. It, it, in a house, we sometimes call it a money pit. You know, that you just can't spend enough money to make it worth staying in that house. And so it's actually the point at which you have to walk away. A good friend of mine, Peter Kelly Detweiler, did a great piece. I'll see if I can dig it up once about uh, nuclear power plants and quarterbacks. Uh, making the argument that nuclear power, many of which are being retired in coal plants as well, um, are like quarterbacks that you pay millions of dollars for for your pro team, and then they just turn out to not be able to pass so good, or whatever it is that you expected them to do. Um, when you have to let that quarterback go, uh, it is important to understand that, yes, you have that money you have to deal with, but um, you don't deduct the stranded cost of the old asset from the potential salary or the cost of the new one. You can manage your stranded costs by running uneconomic resources too long. Uh, there are power utilities in the Midwest that are trying to run uneconomic uh, power coal plants longer than they should and are sticking customers with the costs. Uh, but they're spending more customers are spending more than they should be, and they're having to suffer the pollution. Um, Utility-owned distributed resources. Uh, that's an interesting question, and it all depends on what, you're, what you want your utility to do for you. Um, I'm a fan of a blend. I think the utility should act as a host for private distributed resources. It's good cost discipline. Um, even PRPA um, should should figure out how to enable host and make it easier for private dollars to come flowing in. But I also think there's opportunities for PRPA and the municipalities to do their own distributed resources as they already have been doing uh, in other places, in particular, in order to ensure energy justice. Um, so we focused, for example, when I was at City of Austin in putting city-owned solar systems on rec centers, libraries, public schools, uh, geographically distributed throughout the city uh, and covering those places where the private sector wasn't stepping up. Um, and I thought that was a good blend. And then finally, um, somebody asked about, well, can we just capture the carbon? Um, and there's various ways that people, technologies that are out there, none of them are cost effective and uh, as of yet. And uh, so they're dubious. They might get better in the future. I like research on them. The federal government is doing research on that stuff in some states. I like the research because it tells us what the cost that, you know, one of the costs of the carbon dioxide is. But so far, they're not penciling out as, as resources. All right, I've, I've been talking a lot, so I'm gonna keep moving here. I wanna talk about these habits and then we'll get to the final question and answer period. The good news is that I've covered a lot of this stuff throughout this talk, so I can go pretty quickly through some of these things. I will hone in on a couple of points. Um, and this is based on my experience and a, a little bit of reflection on what I've seen from PRPA so far. Um, the first thing that the really best planning utilities do is they open data rooms. They just make a place on the internet. We did this in Austin. Uh, they still have a virtual data room for everything that's going on with the utility with lots of data uh, that you can get every single updated every year. Um, so an open data room where people can poke around and, and see what the numbers mean. Um, 
that's a really good part of a planning process too. Um, if you have to use sensitive data, it's not common, um, but if you do, you should be able to allow some st stakeholders to get involved with that data by executing non-disclosure agreements. Um, you also need to be really transparent about the model. Unfortunately, a lot of these really expensive utility models cost ten, many tens of thousands of dollars to, to gain a license to, and the, the data and the assumptions inside of them are confidential. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't know any modelers except for people doing spreadsheet models. And by the way, there's some really good citizen leading groups doing those. But for the really big models, they charge license fees and they keep their algorithms proprietary, the, the formulas. Uh, but they at least let you see all the assumptions. When we did our planning at Austin, we distributed and published all the assumptions data. Not only that, we also went to our stakeholders and said, hey, if you don't like our portfolios, you propose some. And we gave three portfolios each to our stakeholder groups and said, come back with any scenario you, you want. We'll run it through the model for you. Just stick with the assumptions so that we can do apples to apples comparisons. Uh, there's no reason why scenarios development has to be a wholly owned enterprise of the modeler or the utility. Um, and that's a really, really good way to build public confidence in what you're doing as well. And then finally, uh, it's really important for the utility to be appreciative of the fact that a lot of these stakeholders, I know they, when you're a utility guy, they can sometimes seem like a nuisance and they make you spend more time, but they're absolutely critical to building support for the policies and the plans. Um, and, that, and I said that intentionally, for the policies that the policymakers are doing and for the plans that the utility develops. Um, letting stakeholders treating them respectfully um, and letting them be a big part of the process is a great way to get results that everybody's already pre-bought into. So uh, big stuff. Um, all right, what else? Well, as to the data, it need, you need well-documented and reputable cost estimates. You can't say, hey, we use data from XYZ source um, and we modified it without telling me what their data was, uh, letting me know who they are to know whether or not they might have any bias, uh, and then how you modified them. So you gotta, you just, the data has to be transparent, um, it, even if the formulas are not. I mentioned the resource chunk size. Uh, you know, this wisdom model we're working with works down at like the five kilowatt scale, uh, Aurora, 50 megawatts, a GS 100 megawatts, thousands of times more. Uh, you can't model distributed resources in chunks that big, as I already said. You also, I already told you, price estimates and calibration of price, price data must be transparent. Um, you gotta be careful how you show your numbers. Uh, one of the things, and this is a PRPA thing, there's one place where they used a graph where they just showed um, uh, nominal numbers. And nominal numbers stretching out 20 years um, look very different than real numbers because real numbers are adjusted for discount rates or inflation. Um, and the best way to compare numbers is to use real numbers consist with consistent discount rates or inflation rates for all the resources you're considering. Um, I know you can make costs look like they're rising if you don't use real numbers and include inflation. But the truth is that even modest increases in costs over time mean essentially the price is staying flat when you account for inflation. And you gotta be fair about how you use that. I already mentioned the term lease cost. Um, another, There's a lot of places where, where uh, mischief can hide. Lease cost, reliability, resilience, um, uh, well, dispatchability, et cetera. And then finally, again with stakeholders, when people ask a question, give a direct, honest, and complete answer. Uh, we, Those of us who have raised teenagers know uh, what a partial or an avoiding answer is, and we've perfected the ability to know when we're getting bamboozled. Um, it works the same way with the utilities. When you're modeling, as I already explained with the diagrams, you've got to do the food feedback loops. You've got to let the results inform modifications to your assumptions, or else you're just hardening your opinion and you're missing the point. 
Um, you've got to not backload decisions, as I mentioned before. You can't just, and in 2029, a miracle. Um, a plan, a real plan, starts laying the groundwork for the, for the big changes that you expect to happen by your planning deadline. Um, and that includes even if you put eight conditions on what needs to happen in order to achieve that planning deadline. The, that, to me, those eight principles in the resource diversification plan from the PRPA board are the agenda for what PRPA should be doing in its resource planning. How are they going to ensure there's better transmission? How are they going to ensure there's better integration with distributed resources? Those are the things I'd want to see in the final IRP. Um, you got to integrate the results of the studies. You can't just go out there and get a stack of studies and throw, put them on the table. You got to show how they're useful and how they inform the planning. Uh, studies for studies sake uh, do benefit the researchers, but they don't benefit anybody else. Um, you got to account for all your value streams. Uh, it's this is really important in the storage area, where uh, and unfortunately PRPA's uh, study of storage did not assess all the ancillary benefits and other uh, grid benefits that storage can provide. Uh, that's not a good way to look at a resource. Uh, so you got to account for all of them, and then um, develop meaningful. That was supposed to be something else, but we'll skip that for now, and I'll fix it later. Um, finally, highly effective planning modeling. Um, two, you got to show your work as as much as you legally can, and 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 more. Uh, what are you doing, and how did you get here? Uh, avoid policy moral hazards. Uh, things like uh, saying that if we have excess energy, we'll sell it, and we won't, or we'll buy it, or we need excess energy, we'll buy it, and we won't care about the carbon associated with that. Uh, you can't give yourself an out where you cheat on the policy when you're planning. You've got to be consistent with your policy objectives throughout so that you don't uh, get tempted to uh, do things that are sort of cheap and easy. you got to honor, honor your past mistakes. If you've done overbuilding in the past, look hard at whether or not you're doing overbuilding again. Being conservative is something we actually like about our utility managers, uh, but it also can be a limiting flaw. You got to keep your models consistent. This is stay in model space. Allow for apples to apples comparisons. Don't use one set of assumptions here and another set of assumptions there because then you won't be able to figure out what the differences are. Again, transparency. And then you got to evaluate economics, not just constraints. You got to look at how things work out in terms of costs and benefits at all levels and not just impose limits on resource options. Okay, my last polling question, and we'll, we've, we'll have a few minutes for, for more questions and answers. Um, now that I know more, you know, hopefully I've gotten you to know more, um, I am glad folks like uh, the, the, the <laughs> glad folks like the, 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 clean, uh, the clean energy advocates uh, are at the job. Uh, NHP, 4CE, and PICA are on the job here. I'm seeking more information and I'm going to have, I, I want a chance to speak my mind. And I'm thankful for all the hard work that everybody, the boards, the city leaderships, PRPA, and the, the stakeholders are doing, and all of the above. So, last poll question uh, tell me how you're feeling right now. And then we'll start reviewing some of these questions that you've been submitting and figure out what you've got to say.
Okay, about, oh, say 15 seconds more. All righty, let's wrap this up. I think we kind of know where you folks are, are coming here. Um, I, and I feel really good, thank you, uh, uh, that, that you, um, you're agreeing with all of these things that you, at, at least right now, are motivated to stay involved, um, to express your opinions about these things as you see more and understand more. You should challenge um, your elected officials and your hired officials at the utilities and at the at PRPA with your questions because first of all, I, I think they really enjoy talking about what they're doing. They're really glad to have you interested. They will feel better knowing where your what your opinion is. Even harder, I'm afraid, it's also going to be incumbent on you to think about how you're going to engage others. You're a self-selected audience. Um, you care about this stuff. You already had some interest or you wouldn't have spent this time with, with this exercise and with these webinars. Um, for every one of you, there are many more who aren't paying attention, but for whom it matters as well. Um, some people don't have the time and they're counting on you as opinion leaders and involved and engaged citizens. We do that in a lot of aspects. That puts an, a, a, a big responsibility on you. Um, but there's also an opportunity to just converse with people. I used to, when I lived in the woodlands in, in Texas, uh, I, I took advantage of, of compact fluorescent lights. And I used to bring everybody into my house to see how much cooler my kitchen was than theirs. Um, and uh, I sold a lot of light bulbs, <laughs> even if I wasn't in the business. So there's opportunities in many ways to do this stuff. Okay, so um, the results are in. Um, you care, you're thankful, you, you're engaged. Now let's get uh, finished here and go into the final question uh, and answer session. Once again, let me pull out a couple of, just two things uh, real quick here. Um, does PRPA need to scrap everything and start over? No, no. A lot of good work, a lot of data, good data has been collected. A lot of good understanding has been gained. A lot of appreciation you know, has, been, um, has been developed. But let's not kid ourselves. No one model does it all. Now there are opportunities to look at things differently. Um, there are engaged citizens with models or calculations or estimates or data or information that should be considered. There's models like this wisdom model that may lend some information um, and some insight. There are analyses from others as well. Uh, uh, you know, you can challenge your cost assumptions by looking at half a dozen or more different cost assumption estimates that are out there for distributed energy resources. Go high, go low, uh, do sensitivity analysis around the results and figure out what's driving the model. Um, the, uh, let's see, there was, um, actually I'll stop there and see if my organizers have, because I may have skipped over some others. It, guys, uh, any additional questions that uh, you think I ought to be bringing out uh, or addressing? Yeah, Carl, there's one in particular that I don't think you addressed, um, but you just addressed a good one. Um, how about this one? Um, a, uh, an attendee asks, I understand that the goal is to achieve 100% carbon-free energy by 2030, but would achieving 99%, 90 to 95% reduction by 2025 be better in the short term? Yeah, and the answer is yes. Um, first of all, there is technological serendipity. Uh, you know, there's just good things can happen. And if 100 is stopping you because it gives you some, you know, obscenely high or unacceptable cost, then, and 95 gives you something that looks a lot more workable, yes. Uh, Pursue 95, um, and it's not as big a, and then a miracle assumption to assume you get to the last 5%. Every clean energy initiative I've seen in the last 30 years, I've been paying attention to this, has overperformed expectations. Again, it's because we're using a foundation of a very and appropriately 
conservative industry mindset. So the odds favor uh, serendipity, they, uh, or what seems like serendipity. The odds favor improving learning curves, as we learned with computers. Remember the fundamentals here. Distributed energy resources are driven by economies of manufacturing scale. Unlike central station power plants, the more we make of them, of these distributed resources, the less expensive they get, the more features they develop, the more solutions they can address. So it is always reasonable to leave yourself a little wiggle room. It also preserves optionality. Um, you may want to make a slightly different, take a different direction uh, and preserving 5% and closing that gap in the next IRP or shifting that, uh, shifting the resources in the next IRP or the IRP after that will give you a chance to stay up with technology and uh, with your knowledge. So yes, I'm a big fan of that idea especially since I understand the breaking point is down around that 95% uh, where the S curve starts doing its inflection. All right, thank you. Um, Ronald Larson, who uh, has a long history with Cress, um, is stating, I want to push harder on the excess atmospheric carbon topic. What price increment is acceptable to get carbon out of the atmosphere? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's, I mean, um, what price is accept? What price increment is acceptable? Here's where I'd start. I don't have the answer, but here's where I'd start if I was doing the analysis. There was this fantastically wonderful man named Frank Ackerman who died just recently, a year or so, within the last year maybe. He was, I guess, what you'd call an ecological economist or something. Um, he advocated understanding climate economics with four very easy principles, a very understandable and accessible principles. I used to include these in my presentations. It was called climate economics in four easy pieces, and you can look it up. Um, what do probably Dr. Ackerman said was the first thing is um, don't use the weighted average cost of capital or excessively discount the future. Um, the joke side of that is that on a discounted cash flow basis, the world is not worth saving because the future is worth less than today. Um, but when it comes to my grandkids and your grandkids or, you know, and their kids and, and whatever, using too big a discount rate uh, is a good way to say they're not worth much to you. So look at these things like the social cost of carbon and technologies that reduce carbon emissions. And don't apply the 5% weighted average cost of capital, which essentially zeroes out that resource in 35 years um, or, or less. Um, so that's number one. Number two is uh, understand the value of insurance. We have insurance, fire insurance on our homes, not because the risk of a household fire is big. It's not, because the con but because the consequences are freaking huge especially in a place like I live in a dense urban environment, if my house catches on fire, the chances are 10 more could as well. So we require insurance. Think of climate investments as having an insurance policy. Third, while we can, we are really good at applying numbers to lots of things, um, the resources upon which all our wealth and welfare are ultimately derived are immeasurable in value. They're called natural capital. Uh, breathable air, fertile soil, swimmable, fishable waters, drinkable waters. Um, these are infinite in value. So don't overdo it on the cost effectiveness evaluation. And then finally, understand that everything costs something. Uh, I think the original rule of ecology was there's no such thing as a free lunch. But not all costs are the same. I can give you a scenario for emergency rooms and breathing units for kids with asthma from urban air pollution, or I can give you a scenario for pollution control, for getting electricity into school buses instead of diesel fuel. I can make those numbers roughly equal, but that does not mean they are the same. 
um, some costs are better than other costs, even a world in which everything has cost. So that's my philosophical starting response to that question. Uh, here's one I think people would like to know as an answer to. Uh, are you going to be involved in the PRPA IRP? I don't know. <laughs> I'm glad to be working with these groups, uh, you know, in the communities on doing this work and to have more conversations uh, as we can do them in this crazy COVID world. Uh, we're hoping to talk with more of the policy leaders and and hopefully even eventually with PRPA themselves. Um, that schedule is to be determined, and uh, my the level of involvement is is to be determined as well. Great. I think we should end on there. Um, All right. Well, let me end by saying thanks sure. for being patient with me. Um, thanks for being interested in this. Uh, we'll share these slides, uh, and um, and I do I do just consider it such an honor to share this evening with you. Great. Thank you, Carl. And thank, thank you for your excellent presentation. You went through so much information. It was all very valuable. Um, we will all very much appreciate it. And thanks to the uh, co-organizers and uh, everyone who attended. Um, like I stated in the beginning, um, we will be sending out a link to the recording of this webinar and um, we'll have slides available as well. Um, and will you make will be able to make these uh, slides available, Carl? Be it down absolutely, absolutely. Yes, I'm going to check for a couple of little errors I spotted uh, and make sure there's a clean version. Uh, but yes, they will be available. It's pretty big, um, so we'll figure out the best way to make it downloadable. Great. Um, and uh, I just wanted to point another thing out for those still on the line. Um, if you can go to uh, Cress's website. Uh, crest-energy.org and, um, and, and, and re-up your membership information uh, and thanks to all of our partners involved in this webinar. Um, we will be sending out information on some future webinars that should be interesting to you um, and everyone have a safe and pleasant evening. Thank you again, Carl. Thank you.